Hello everybody, we are back. We're on our next video for Social Psych from Unit 9. And today we're going to be working on altruism. Um, so we're going to actually talk about altruism and then we'll go into conflict and peacemaking. All right, so altruism, right? So the top of your notes are going to say this and please remember to follow along. Please make sure to skip lines after every main point. Um, if you see, there's always skipping a line. Um, and highlighting as well would be good, especially for the kind of like your subtopics. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to start with the first one, which is altruism. And what exactly is altruism? And that is when um, it's kind of like a concept or a practice of selfless behavior out of concern for the well-being of others, okay? So I'll say that again. So it's basically a concept or a practice of selfless behavior, okay, to, about ourselves, out of concern for the well-being of others. It's basically that we are going to help other people um, and not so much think about um, ourselves. So it's kind of like we are concerned for the welfare of others. So make sure to include that as well. Okay. Now, under here, I want you also to include um, under altruism, you're going to write down altruistic norms. And I'll write it here. Alt well, maybe I'll write it there. Okay. So, which is altruistic norms. And this is when the expectation, okay, so altruistic norms means it is the expectation of acting on behalf of the group rather than in self-interest, okay? So altruistic norm, right? It's kind of like the norm is to help people in a group rather than our self-interest, okay? Um, so for example, when there's a hurricane or a tornado, like natural disasters, you tend to see a lot of people, instead of just worrying about themselves, um, they also, they're going to help um, the group, right? And not just people that were affected, but people outside, right? Every time you'll see, whenever there's a natural disaster or something happens in a state, people are going to try to help out as much as they can by giving donations and so forth, okay? Um, now, I want you to write under altruism these two guys' names. It's John Darley and Bib Latane, okay? Because they're the ones that really kind of, they're social psychologists that are going to really study why is it, what needs to happen in order for people to help other people. Okay, um, and this came out, so you definitely need to know their names. So they're the people that kind of started this. They wanted to know what are some circumstances that have to be present in order for others to help one other people, okay? And this kind of came about because there was the case of Kitty Genovese, and you need to know this person's name um, and kind of like what happens with this girl. And this is actually a case that happened in 1964 in New York City, in which a man basically stabbed Kitty Genovese multiple times. I'm not quite sure if he was he raped and stabbed her, but anyway, he ended up killing her. And what happened was that, um, and why it was such a big deal is because she was screaming for help, and tons of neighbors watched and heard but nobody helped, okay? So this came in which, which would later be called the bystander effect. So these are the people that kind of studied this, and I'm sure that you guys have seen this, um, seen this word before. Um, if not, that's okay. But bystander effect is basically, definitely need to know. So it could be called bystander effect or diffusion of responsibilities, okay? And this just basically means that we, this is the tendency to, and write it, make sure you're writing all this down, <laughs> is that the tendency to, um, less, we're less likely to help others when, or help someone when other people are present, okay? 
So this is their tendency to, um, that we tend to not help someone if other people are present, okay? And then under bystander effect, also include this. This bystander effect is basically, we justify that we don't help because nobody else is helping um, as well. Okay, this is where you typically will see, um, especially on social media, if somebody's fighting, everybody kind of takes out their camera and starts recording. Um, and it, that's a perfect example of that bystander effect in which they kind of just, well, nobody else is helping. So I'm just going to do the same thing or stand back. Okay, now there is this thing called the bystander intervention. And this is when one person, all it takes is one person that will help in an emergency, especially an emergency, like somebody's getting really hurt. Um, and they'll basically jump in to help that one person, even when there's other people around. So then what ends up happening with the bystander intervention is that then other people are going to jump in and help. Right. So this is great to know um, because when you see something happening, right, and we kind of like stand back and we don't want to get involved. Um, but all it really takes is just one person, one person to be courageous enough to step in, okay, to help somebody else. Now, you also need to know what are some circumstances that so from this study that John Darley does and Bib Latane, what they ended up doing, they're studying, is they found out there are certain circumstances that are needed in order for people to help. And the first one is, you're going to write this down, is that uh, people are more willing to help if um, it appears that the person deserves or actually needs help. Okay, so that's one, that they actually need or deserve to be helped. Second thing is that the person that is like the victim or that needs help is either has some similarity to us or has like a similar background or like we could see ourselves in that person. Okay, the next one is that um, they just observe someone being helpful to somebody else. So if I see somebody helping, I'm more likely willing to help somebody else. Uh, the next one is if they're not in a hurry. If they're not in a hurry, they're going to help. Um, also, another thing, so there's more than four, okay? So make sure you're writing that. The next one is if they're feeling guilty for not helping or feeling guilty for what's happening, um, and the last one is that they're actually, that they're in a good mood. So all of these things, right? Like, do they deserve to help, like be helped? Um, do they seem similar to us or not, or have similar backgrounds? Um, if they seem, if I'm, if I'm not in a hurry, if I'm feeling guilty or if I'm in a good mood and if I've seen other people helping, then I'm more likely to help somebody, okay? Now, what are the norms for helping? And the norms for helping are kind of um, exactly what it means, right? Like the norm for everybody usually in order to help. It's kind of like what drives us. And the first thing is going to be social exchange theory, okay? Social exchange theory is basically that we believe that helping people is an exchange process in which um, I am going to also, so it's an exchange process in which um, I'm going to look at the benefits of helping as well as looking at the cost if I help. Okay. Now, so write that down. So it's kind of like an exchange, social exchange. So it's an exchange in which I'm going to look at, I'm going to out see if the my helping is going to be a benefit or is it going to be, or is it going to cost me, okay? 
Um, so it's kind of like you weigh the cost. So for instance, um, let's say I see a bunch of like, so this is kind of what happened when I was teaching. Here's my example. I had a student, um, she was very aggressive and she was fighting with a boy, right? Like one of my students. Now I tried to break it up but it got really bad and i was like okay like i looked at i need to look at my safety as opposed to them and they were kind of like just running around type thing um and looking you know seeing was it going to cost me more like was i going to get more injured than they were um and so what ended up happening i had to go get help right and um so that you know very quick decision because i had to outweigh either my safety or, you know, I mean, they weren't hurting themselves really. Um, if I would have jumped in, I would have definitely gotten hurt. So it's kind of like if the reward exceeds the cost, so make sure you write that down, you will help. Okay. This is why many times a lot of people, when they see a fight, they're like, I can't stop that. Right. Like a bunch of guys fighting, I'm not going to be able to stop that, but I can help. Right. And call 911, call somebody a security or whatnot, okay? The next one is gonna be reciprocity norm, okay? Reciprocity, like think of like reciprocal, okay? In which it's the expectation that if someone or a group helped you, you're writing this down, you should help them in return, okay? So it's kind of like, um you scratch my back i'll scratch yours right if you helped me i am going to help you so reciprocity norm is that like reciprocal write that down so that you see it's a reciprocal thing if you help me i'll help you and then vice versa okay and then the next one is going to be social responsibility norm and this is when so social responsibility norm, like you're being responsible for the group, is the expectation that people, especially those that are in position of authority, help others even at a cost to themselves, okay? So I'll say that again, it's the expectation that people, especially those in position of authority or power, you they help others even at a cost to themselves, right? Like firefighters do this, police officers, teachers, right? And you'll see this in which, you know, sadly in school shootings, these people that are like of authority or people look up to, they're usually the ones that step in to help like for the greater good of everybody else, okay? Especially with social responsibility norm, you know, um, we usually want to make sure the expectation is that we help, especially those less fortunate or those that have are not able to help themselves, specifically like children or elders or people with disabilities. OK, so that tends to be um, part of that. OK, the social responsibility. norm. All right. So that's going to stop there. Then you're going to go. Um, if you want to start on a new page or kind of put a line through it, we're going to go into conflict and peacemaking. Okay. And this is usually what happens when a group of people get together, right? You're going to have conflicts and then you have to find ways of creating peace. Don't have to be best friends, but definitely peacemaking. And you guys will actually go into a little bit of reading, um, in class about peacemaking. Okay. So. First of all, what is conflict? And conflict is, and we're writing this down, is basically any opposing actions, ideas, or goals that occur when we're interacting with others, right? So it's basically, I'm gonna have my own actions or ideas or goals that are gonna be different than other groups, okay? Um, so, it this creates social dilemmas and social dilemmas are basically situations that places the desire of the individual into conflict with the good of the group okay so social dilemmas are when the so there are situations in which the desire of the individual okay like their needs and their wants conflict with the good of the group okay 
This can be also called, and write this down, mixed motive interactions. So it's mixed motives, oops, motive interactions. And it's just basically exactly what it means, right? That our motivation or our motive to do something is going to be different than somebody else's. And then that's what creates conflict, right? This happens with your friends, with the people you don't like, okay? Um, and, it, and it happens because everybody kind of has their own thoughts and ideas. Now, what they do, social psychologists do, is they actually created, there's these two social dilemmas that are hypothetical scenarios, okay? And I want you to write that down. They're hypothetical scenarios that create a social dilemma. And they are called the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the commons. And you guys will actually, we'll talk a little bit more in class about it. But the prisoner's dilemma is basically you have two prisoners and they're both in two separate rooms. And then they tell them like, hey, like prisoner A, they'll be like, look, if you confess, you're going to only get, um, if you confess, the other person's going to get five years and you're going to get none. If you don't confess, you'll only get a year. If, you know, and then they'll tell the other person the same thing. And what ends up seeing, and there's a little diagram, we'll talk about it in class, but it's basically like if nobody confesses, right? So this is like the greater good of the group, they only will do one year, right? Because that's what they tell them. Like, oh, if you don't confess, it'll be just one year. But they tell that to the other person. Um, so technically, if nobody confesses and they just stay silent, both parties ends up with just going with one year. Now, again, this is a hypothetical. It's not really a, what they did. Um, and then the other one is the tragedy of the commons, which has to do with like the piece of land, like, like the common land. And then each farmer can only put one cow on this piece of land because um, when they do, a, it could only be one cow because they have to like graze on the grass and then they move them to another area and then they wait that time when it's in somewhere else the cow somewhere else that grass gets you know grows back again and then the cows can come back anyway point of the thing is if a, so every every farmer has to only have one cow on each little piece of land if they get selfish right this is the whole thing about the tragedy of the commons if they get selfish and add another cow even though it's just one more cow it actually affects like it's overgrazing and what ends up happening if all of the farmers do that then they basically will have no land and nobody will have any cows or food basically that's the whole thing of that okay so it's just kind of like uh do you want you know the whole point of these um hypotheticals is kind of to see do you want to wait like long term for the greater good of everybody or is it just all about me right now right what's going to benefit me but in the long run it's going to affect myself and everybody else okay so it's kind of like what these um social dilemmas hypotheticals uh, are all about okay now we're going to go on to the next one which is social trap and this is basically situations in which a group of people act in a way that yields a positive short-term benefit for the individual okay so this is a situation in which a group of people act in a way that is a positive short-term benefit for themselves but it hurts the group overall in the long run okay and we're actually going to do a little experiment in class with social a social trap um and it will actually have to do with extra credit so it's very interesting uh what happens so with social trap i want you to add in there that it typically um with social traps it's like it challenges the it challenges this concept of do i um make a decision for myself right now or do i not do something and allow 
for the greater good for the group. Like something good will happen to the group, but it'll be later. Okay. And you'll see with my little experiment that we do in class. Um, so with social trap, it's kind of like you have two decisions to make and one is going to benefit you in the short term. But if you waited, the other option would be, it would be good for everybody, but you're probably not just getting as much if you were selfish and just took it for yourself. Okay. It'll make more sense when we do a little experiment. Okay. So with these conflicts comes what we call enemy perception. And what ends up happening is that when conflict arises, there tends to be a, um, a tendency for us to create really negative images about the other person. Okay. Right. So like with, just think about it, people that go against what you say or teachers that get you in trouble, or there's a conflict right? You start creating these perceptions of the enemy in a very negative night light. So one of the things that we do, make sure to write what that is, the enemy perception is us creating negative images of people that we're in conflict with. Um, and the word is, and just think of all the people we fight with, how many times we're like, oh, they're so evil, bad. Ah. <laughs> a, so the first one is called mirror image perception. And mirror image perception is when members of the opposing group have the same negative perception of each other. So it's basically the two opposing groups are going to have negative perceptions of one another. Okay. Now include in there that each side sees themselves as the ethical and peaceful person while the other side is the evil and bad ones right so usually the ones obviously that we're in that we see ourselves we're gonna be the ethical and peaceful ones and then the other person the other group is just basically gonna be wrong and bad okay um which then with that continues this hostility between the two groups okay so just think of two friend groups, right? That don't like each other and you're gonna be, that's pretty much what happens, right? One side is like, oh, we're the good people. And then those people are like, no, bad, okay? Which goes into that whole in-group and out-group bias, okay? I wanna include that in there. Then we have self-fulfilling prophecy, which is another one. It's falling under here, the enemy perception. Now this is when it's a negative, okay? So self-fulfilling prophecy is the belief, a belief that leads to its own fulfillment, okay? Um, because, and include that, you tend to see the actions or their own actions as a response to the provocation, okay? Um, which basically just means like, let's say if I'm telling you, you know what, this group, you guys are super mean, um, aggressive, and you're always making fun of other people. And then that other group may act in a way that is going to feed into that self-fulfilling prophecy. Or we as the out group, right? I mean, I'm sorry, as the in group, whatever actions they may do, we may perceive it as that as well. Okay, so make sure to include that. And please guys, make sure that you're pausing, rewinding, I know it's a little annoying and you probably don't wanna hear my voice so long, but that's how it's gonna help guys. Okay, I promise. All right, last but not least, we're gonna go a little bit into peacemaking, okay? And I'm just gonna touch upon actually um, this one component, cause there's a lot of parts of peacemaking um, and I'm only going to talk about, I think like two of them. Okay. So the first one is going to be about cooperation. How do we bring peace amongst the groups when there's conflict? And one of them is cooperation. Okay. Specifically is what's called subordinate goals. 
and you really, really need to know this word, super important. And it was all fun, like started with this guy, Muzaffar Sharif, Sharif, however you wanna call it, okay? Um, and he's a social psychologist that, I'm gonna explain to you the study he does so you understand, okay? But I'm gonna tell you what subordinate goals means. Subordinate goals is when there is a shared goal that can, okay, so a shared goal between two groups that could be achieved only through cooperation of both groups, okay? So basically, they must work together, include this in there, to restore peace, okay? So like teamwork. So this is when two groups are in conflict, they need to have subordinate goals, which is a common goal to um, that they're both basically going to benefit from, okay? Now, he does this study, and I forgot, actually, it was called the Robber's Cave. Okay, and I'll write it here. Robber's Cave Study. It, it's probably not even called that, but it's called the Robber's Cave because it was at this park. Okay, now, you're going to have to pause and write down what you, like, from this um, story. So. First thing is that this happens in a state park during a summer camp, okay? So let's start with that. It was a boys summer camp and there was two summer camp groups at this park, okay? So first week, the two groups did not know anything about each other. They were separated, okay? And in that first week, each group each camp site was basically just getting to know each other. They did activities to get, you know, like that bonding. So that happened first week. The second week, what they did is they slowly started introducing both camps, like the two camps, the two groups of boys. But the way that they did it was through competition, okay? So they had competitions against each other and whoever would win would get like a reward or a prize. Okay, so make sure you have that written down. What happened the first week? What happens the second week? In the second week, those two groups of boys actually started doing really bad or mean things to the sep like to each group. So they started sealing like the camp's flag. They started like uh, messing up their campsites and they even started getting into physical fighting with one another okay so that was the second week by the third week they introduced this idea of subordinate goals in which um the researcher this guy sheriff guy sharif he basically clogs the water supply okay and so both groups had to work together in order to fix the water so that they both could get water. So subordinate goal is kind of like, you need to work together for this common goal that you both have, okay? Um, and then this allowed them to basically come together as one and be peaceful, no more fighting, okay? A second thing that they, is important is communication. Communication, obviously, if two people or two groups can speak to each other, then they're more likely to come to a solution. Sometimes there needs to be what's called a mediator, okay? And a mediator is kind of, um, is a person that is literally a mediator in the middle, listening to both sides and trying to come up with a solution that both would be satisfied, okay? And then, Last but not least is the appeals to altruistic norms. So does it appeal to the altruistic norm of helping others? So um, it's kind of like you're acting on behalf of the group rather than in self-interest. So does this um, appeal to us helping a group rather than just for ourselves, okay? 
and that's basically it thank you for uh, watching please make sure guys that you are skipping a line between all of these different concepts that you're putting examples that you are paying attention and you are reviewing stop the video if you need to or whatnot but you guys know we'll be having our little quizzes on these things so make sure to watch okay bye guys love you